That's our cue. Hello. Yes. Welcome. Welcome back. I'm Michelle Friedman from the Stanford History Department. And in this hour, I'm going to introduce Professor Kornblu. I'm going to say a few words on the Barker here. I want you to know how important this book is <laughs> before you pay attention to her discussion of it. She's going to spend about a half an hour uh, walking through some of the main uh, points of the book. And then I'll raise some questions uh, and then we'll open it up to the whole group. So slightly different format than our earlier sessions. Felicia Kornblu is professor of history and of gender sexuality and women's studies and an affiliated faculty member in Jewish studies at the University of Vermont. She's a writer for both popular and scholarly publications. She's the author of The Battle for Welfare Rights, Poverty and Policy in Modern America, and also the author with co-author Gwendolyn Mink of Ensuring Poverty, Welfare Reform and Feminist Perspective. Today, she's gonna to be discussing her new and widely acclaimed book, A Woman's Life is a Human Life, My Mother, Our Neighbor, and the Journey from Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice, which came out in, I think, January of this year. I would add that Felicia is an activist, a former member of the Vermont Commission on Women and the Board of Trustees of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, as well as the former president of the United Academics, the University of Vermont Faculty Union. She now serves as vice president of the Board of Planned Parenthood of Vermont Action Fund. Now, this is my plug for you not only want to listen to this presentation, you really want to read this book. I had a great, the great pleasure of doing so. And it just could not be more timely for our focus at this conference, legal history as our focus. And this is the perfect book to understand legal strategies related to reproductive choice and freedom in the pre and immediate post row era with close attention to legislation, litigation and policymaking from New York City, New York State to the federal level. But the book is for far more than a legal history. That is, I think it's a deeply researched historical account of social movement formation. It's replete with origins, coalitions, obstacles, strategic decisions, compromises, errors, crises, with sometimes unexpected alliances, unpredictable victories, and really shows us the burden of implementing law once passed and protecting legal change from rapidly coalescing opposition. And perhaps most significantly, the book does this all for two overlapping and sometimes conflictual subjects, the movement to decriminalize abortion and the movement to eliminate involuntary sterilization. So drawing out intersectional reproductive politics throughout. And Cornblow weaves these analytically complex stories into a very highly readable account that brings to life the struggles of concerned women and men, liberals and radicals, Puerto Rican, white, black, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, allies and antagonists, all trying to achieve their goals within the realities of local, state and national politics. Um, she rethinks, for me, periodization of both the reproductive rights, freedom, justice movements and the anti-abortion movement uh, and really draws our attention and to a conversation that we've already been having uh, before and beyond Roe. So I'll save my questions about the book till after Felicia's overview of it. So thank you so much for writing this book and for participating in this presentation and conversation. Well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna stand if that's okay. Um, yeah, and I'll hold that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I couldn't have a better Barker. <laughs> um, and uh, I know where our numbers are um, a little small, but this is also kind of a dream audience for me. Um, so um, thank you for being the dream team here. Um, well, so the book was just published in January. It is called A Woman's Life as a Human Life, My Mother, Our Neighbor, and the Journey from Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice. Um, and uh, in the book, I do, as Professor Friedman just said, I do discuss both the movement for abortion rights, um, what was starting in the 60s, a movement for the decriminalization of abortion, and the movement to control sterilization abuse 
And I see those as sort of two sides of the same coin. And in the introduction to the book, this is made very, very literal when I tell the story of Karen Stam, who's figured here. Um, and Stam was an abortion seeker when she was 18 years old, um, when abortion was still illegal uh, for the most part in New York. But of course, there were exceptions, the so-called therapeutic exception. And Stam was able to obtain a therapeutic abortion um, at a hospital in the Bronx. However, uh, the same doctor who offered her a consent form for the abortion also turned it over. And on the other side was a consent for sterilization. And she was pressured by both the doctor and her own mother to have a sterilization procedure because it was thought that since she was an irresponsible young woman who had had sex out of wedlock and who had become pregnant out of wedlock, um, that uh, that she would likely need another abortion. Um, and also I think there was a suggestion that she was a bad person and that she should not be a parent. So she resisted that, uh, that pressure and later became the only uh, full-time staff person for the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse because of that experience. But I really wanted to illuminate the both sides element of it. Um, and let me just start with a little bit of terminology. When I speak in the title and in the book about reproductive rights, generally I'm using that as shorthand to refer to the movement for legal and accessible abortion um, and uh, to a lesser degree contraception because we're in the, the immediate post Griswold period um, and in the era of Baird versus Eisenstadt when contraception is not um, a matter of protest politics. Um, but by reproductive rights, yeah, we're usually talking about the right to refrain from childbearing. Um, and when the activists talk about the decriminalization of abortion, they use that language very self-consciously because their understanding is this is something that was not a crime before the 19th century. It became a crime, right? There were no criminal statutes about abortion before the in the US before the 19th century, although of course there was common law uh, regulation of abortion. Um, and their effort was to use state statutory law to decriminalize that which state statutory law had criminalized um, in the early 19th century. So that language um, uh, was a critique as well as, as a descriptor of what they were trying to do. Um, by reproductive justice, this is um, the language from the, the group Sister Song, which is uh, one of the leading reproductive justice activist groups in the US today. Um, and uh, the language of reproductive justice, as many of you know, uh, usually refers to a wider set of claims. So of course, reproductive justice activists are seeking uh, the continued safety, accessibility, and legality of abortion and contraception, but also insist on people's right to bear children. and. Uh, and everything that might be required in terms of social change and legal change to enable people to make relatively free choices about when, whether, and not when, uh, under what circumstances to have children. So, in, and Sister Song puts it as reproductive justice, the human right to personal bodily autonomy, the right to have children, to not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities, with a particular um, emphasis on. Uh, black and brown citizens of the US. So um, I came to this story and uh, found my two entree points to the story through two individuals, um, two women. First of all, my mother, the late Beatrice Kogan Cornblue Braun. Um, uh, my mom, that's her in the hat. You can tell the lawyer, but she's the one in the hat with the glasses. Um, and this is her in uh, New York City night court. Um, early in her career, she's standing with a woman criminal defendant. This is a, a photo that ran in the newspaper, I think because the photographer was so kind of titillated by the idea that there was a woman lawyer and a woman criminal defendant. I think she was charged with prostitution being a woman at the evening. Um, and my mother was defending her uh, pro bono. Um, so my mom uh, graduated from Brooklyn Law School without a bachelor's um, in uh, 1954. Um, so that's a little bit before Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, graduated from Columbia. Um, she worked for small firms and did this kind of pro bono um, 
uh, criminal work. Um, and she became, along with my father, she became very involved in the reform democratic movement in New York City, which was a, a movement to bring the Democratic Party um, closer to the civil rights movement and uh, into the movement against the war in Vietnam. Uh, and my mother also was an early member of the National Organization for Women, and particularly its New York City chapter, which was its first local chapter. Um, and as a member of now, my mother's great moment on the historical stage was when she wrote this letter and the accompanying draft legislation. And um, I don't expect you to be able to see the detail, but sometimes it's nice to see the actual document. So um, uh, this is my mom writing to our newly elected state assemblyman, Franz Leister, an Austrian Jewish uh, refugee from the Nazis, uh, whose mother was assassinated by the Nazis. Um, uh, dear Franz, and what she's doing here is she's offering him on behalf of NOW and the Abortion Committee of NOW, which she was a member, she's offering him draft legislation, which um, Constance Cook, an upstate New York Republican, and Leister, an Upper West Side of Manhattan uh, liberal Democrat, would in fact introduce um, at the beginning of the 1969 legislative session, which was a full repeal of all abortion restrictions. Um, and their proposal, the now proposal, was to simply remove abortion from the state code entirely. Um, and, uh, and my mother was the one, as the only attorney on this committee, she was the one who went through the state code in you know, paper form and found every single mention of abortion and uh, drafted legis legislation that would simply remove it. This was the only such, the first such proposal in any legislature anywhere in the United States, um, probably anywhere in the modern West. And it embodied, it both embodied the, the philosophy and the approach of many different branches of the women's movement at the time, and it inspired them. It inspired the formation of NARAL, which was originally called the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws. Um, and um, it inspired uh, the women's movement to make abortion a, a centerpiece and to make that a, a mass movement. Um, my mother was not successful in passing that version of the bill, the now was not successful. However, the bill that did pass, um, although it was watered down from my mother's version, was still by far the most liberal abortion statute in the United States prior to Roe. And it set the stage for Roe in very important ways. Um, the big compromise was that instead of abortion simply being um, available to individuals who decided that that was what was appropriate for them, um, there was a 24 week limit roughly the two trimesters that would later be enshrined in a row, but also roughly the point of quickening from the old common law. Um, uh, abortion remained in the criminal code in New York um, and there was a doctor only requirement. So those also were compromises. However, there was no residence requirement and that was the most transformative sort of out of the box thing about this statute. And so what happened was that people could and did come to New York from every part of the United States and from abroad to have safe legal abortions two and a half years before Roe versus Wade. Um, so the other person who's at the center of the story is um, our late next door neighbor who was an extraordinary person, um, uh, very unjustly neglected by US women's and gender history. Um, named Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias. So um, Rodriguez Trias was a Puerto Rican physician about the same age as my mom, um, but trained professionally a little bit later. She had had kids before she went to med school. Um, her, her first political efforts were anti-imperialist and independentist for the island of Puerto Rico. And um, after she got trained as a doctor, she became a leader in neonatology in San Juan. Um, and then after the breakup of her second marriage, she came to New York and kind of by coincidence, she wound up being the director of pediatrics at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx, which had recently been taken over by the Young Lords Party, the Puerto Rican militant organization, which was moving um, a, a community control based healthcare politics as a central part of its agenda and opposition to sterilization abuse, both on the island of Puerto Rico and on the US mainland in public hospitals like Lincoln was an integral part of the Young Lords agenda. Um, and so Rodriguez Trias um, 
had her training as a doctor and her background as an anti-imperialist and Puerto Rican independentist, and then got an additional education um, in this particular kind of radical healthcare politics at Lincoln. Uh, in the mid seventies, Rodriguez Trias with members of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party and a group of white socialist feminists uh, became a founder of the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse or CESA. Um, and uh, Helen, to, to the eyes of most of the people uh, who were in CESA was really the, the glue that held the group together. She could speak kind of easily to, to the white socialist feminists. Um, she was in the, the she had been in the um, abortion decriminalization movement and in the women's health movement as it was rising. And so she, she was hanging out with a lot of white left feminists. And she also was a fellow traveler of the PSP, the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. Um, so she really held the group together and they became the first dedicated anti-sterilization abuse organization in US history. Um, and they had a series of successes, also unjustly forgotten, usually in our histories, first in the New York City public hospital system, then at the New York City council level, um, passing new anti-sterilization guidelines. Um, importantly, their key opposition, right, was the very, the very organizations that my mother affiliated with most, most powerfully, the National Organization for Women. At the national level in particular, the New York City chapter changed its position. Um, and started to favor the sterilization guidelines and um, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood was probably their most powerful opposition. Um, and the ACLU was interestingly confused, um, <laughs> which we can talk about if people are interested. Uh, by the end of the 70s, at the end of the 70s, after the Hyde Amendment, um, most of the members of CESA also become members of this other organization, the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization Abuse, or CARASA. Um, so Helen is part of CARASA, um, and so are the other PSP members, some of the PSP members, um, and the white socialist feminists. And then there's a much larger group of, uh, of white left feminists, some socialist feminists, some radical feminists, who together form uh, CARASA, which is the first organization that both pursues um, abortion rights and opposes sterilization abuse actively. And it's CARASA that generates this idea of reproductive freedom. Um, I think maybe that language had, had been around already, I'm not really sure, um, when it starts being used by the ACLU, for example, but they give it this particular meaning, which is very much like contemporary uh, meanings of reproductive justice. And they, so they say reproductive freedom means the possibility of controlling for themselves in a real and practical way that is free from economic, social, or legal coercion, whether and under what conditions they, people, um, will have children. So, um, so that's basically what the book is about. Um, so just briefly, um, why did I uh, do this project? Why did I structure it this way? Um, I started with a desire to understand my parents. Um, I started working on the book after my mother died. Um, and, I've, and I learned about her role. Um, and uh, I also, I was very moved from my teaching. I've been teaching for many years about the tension between the, the mainstream movement for reproductive rights and reproductive justice, because I teach the history of feminism almost every year. And, um, and, and I've been very influenced by Loretta Ross, um, who's both an activist and a, an intellectual in this area, um, was very, very important. And by this book that she wrote with um, Ricky Sollinger, um, a white historian um, called Reproductive Justice and Introduction. Um, and, uh, and it occurred to me that we didn't really have good historical work on early precursors to or possible roots of contemporary reproductive justice thinking and politics. Um, and then I also, um, I think, uh, even though it might seem discontinuous, I wrote two books about poverty and anti-poverty movements, and uh, and here's a book about reproductive rights. It's reproductive justice that really is the connecting tissue there for me. Um, so I actually see this as very continuous with the other research I've done. Um, uh, just briefly on sources, and again, if people are interested, I can say more about this. I used a combination of really... Um, really traditional mainstream kinds of sources like Justice Blackman's papers when I was interested in Roe versus Wade and Harris versus McRae, the, the Hyde Amendment case. Um, 
And then I also use things that were not so conventional. And I think the combination of the two is very productive. Um, uh, I mean, and, and on the unconventional side, although this is paper records, um, this document that I showed you, um, it's my mother's moment on the historical stage. That doesn't appear in any public archive. I only have it because I went to Pittsburgh and I went to David Garrow's basement. <laughs> um, uh, David Garrow, the historian and political scientist, um, uh, is. it turns out he's a crazy pack rat and he kept everything that he gathered for his, the big book he did on Roe versus Wade, Liberty and Sexuality. And uh, at a time when all the regular archives were closed anyway for the pandemic, Garrow uh, graciously allowed me to come and, and do research in his kitchen, <laughs> hanging out with his dog. And he's the only one who has this piece of paper. So I finally found out that like the story that I had vaguely heard in my family, my dad used to say, oh, you know, that law that decriminalized abortion was written in our living room. Um, yeah, so I finally had the receipts on that. Um, because I went to Pittsburgh and settled in. Um, whoops, sources. Um, and the other thing was that I used a lot of oral history sources, um, at, in part because of the pandemic, everybody was home and a little bored and sort of nostalgic. Um, and, uh, and a lot of paper sources weren't available to me, but that wound up being so, so rich and so important, especially in finding out, um, how important these experiences were for the, especially for the members of Sesa and Karasa and how still bitter um, their losses and their falling outs are to many of them. Um, uh, and just briefly, um, in terms of what I think the, the kind of payoff is theoretically and methodologically, um, I think that, um, I think there's a lot <laughs> Um, you know, as I got further into this, I realized that there's a lot that um, the his those of us in the history of women, gender, and sexuality really haven't covered, even though some of these issues seem so um, uh, so much like the elephants in the middle of the room in terms of modern feminist politics. Um, uh, but to me, it was really important to tell these critical stories, both of legal victories that we haven't really accounted for and divisions that we haven't fully accounted for. Um, and in particular, this, this division over the sterilization guidelines that come from CESA and CARASA, um, I almost see that division as, as, as significant as the divisions that happened in the 19th century over the 14th and 15th amendments, you know, which is something I teach um, at least one semester a year, every, every year of my teaching career. Um, you know, this moment when uh, a virtually all white wing of the women's movement decides that it's more important to protest the, those um, reconstruction amendments um, than to try and figure out a way to stay in an interracial movement. And um, I see something very similar here and it's both, um, it's both uh, kind of bad for the movement. It's a moment of, of division and loss, um, but it also, I think, becomes a moment of great productivity for women of color feminisms that emerge in the at really in the, at the very end of the '70s and then into the '80s. And the issue of sterilization abuse is very critical. Like if you read the Kambahi River Collective Statement and other things, I think the sterilization abuse um, issue, which Planned Parenthood and now really don't get um, and even oppose. Um, is it's, it's generative, right? It's it's both a moment of loss and a moment of generativity, I think. Um, and I think this is, you couldn't have a better example of quote unquote intersectional politics um, and, the, and the, failure, the failures and successes of intersectional understanding. I, I found, for example, my mother used to always talk about um, about, about abortion providers in the pre-row era as quote unquote butchers, right? That's a very, a very common discourse. And what I found was that, for example, um, Puerto Ricans in the South Bronx, um, who affiliated with the Young Lords Party, among others, they referred to their, their whole local hospital as a center of butchery, right? It was medicine itself, mainstream medicine, the medicine that, that was being provided to them by the city of New York that was a center of butchery. And so I really learned about how, how diverse experiences shape, um, shape the very meaning of health, healthcare, you know, um, women's rights, et cetera. Um, 
And uh, I also see myself as operating within legal history, particularly social legal history. And I think these are these are great stories for showing how um, society shapes law in a variety of ways, social movements shape law, but also legal insiders were and are extremely important, right? And there are a variety of legal insiders or quasi-insiders who play key roles. Um, and I think that's it's important for us to remember both the way that um, social movements and social forces transform law and the way that uh, that legal practices and discourses have independent power and legal insiders um, play a role. Um, and then lastly, um, I think probably everybody in this room will be on my side when I'd say, I think it's very important for us, with, especially people with a kind of socio-legal and social history background for us to participate in conversations about constitutional law, for us not to leave it to journalists, for us not to leave it um, to law professors who don't have this, this background. Um, and, uh, and I was trying deliberately to do that, um, to participate in a, even before I knew that Roe was gonna be overturned, to participate actively in conversations about constitutional law, bringing all my, my good social history training with me on that journey. Um, and then in part, that's also the reason that I wrote this book for a trade audience, because I wanted to reach as many people as I could who I think and I think many people do care about constitutional legal matters and they should know the real history. So, thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, she's just touching the highlights and I wanna draw out some other things that are in the book, but also raise some questions that the, the book raised for me, uh, for starters. And I think that, I'm actually going to start talking to ask you to talk a little bit more about religion, because one of the um, surprises for me uh, was the, you know, filling in the other actors who we often don't talk about and uh, really liberal religious community, for one thing. And I'd like you to say just a little bit more about why they're important to this New York story. And then also um, something that I've raised with you about uh, particularly the role of the Catholic Church and whether there were or were not alliances. So one of the surprise stories is how successful CESA is in getting these restrictions on um, what we might call coercive um, sterilizations on, on, on putting roadblocks up to them. And there, you give a lot of credit to the grassroots organizing and to the really the confluence of the activism of people like the Young Lords, plus the socialist feminists, plus the, you know, um, uh, Dr. Rodrigo Stress, et cetera. But I kept thinking about if there wasn't also a strong Catholic interest going on here in limiting um, sterilization as well. And so that while you, and just to open up to talk a little about where religion plays into both the um, decriminalization movement and the um, uh, uh, limitations on um, involuntary sterilization. Yeah, thank you. Um, I did, I'll just talk about liberal um, religious denominations first. Um, one of the things I wanted to underline in the, in the book was the role of quote unquote people of faith um, on the decriminalization side. And um, New York was home to the biggest and most important abortion referral network in the country, which was the clergy consultation service on abortion. Um, and I think probably everybody's heard about Jane by now, right? We've had two movies, three movies. Um, um, no shade on Jane. Jane, Jane was great. Um, the clergy consultation service, which was run out of Judson Memorial Church in Lower Manhattan, was way, way bigger and more important in terms of the number of people who were reached, right? And they had a national network. There were thousands of people who got safe, illegal abortions as a result of this clergy network, which was, so it was run initially out of this one liberal Protestant church in Manhattan. And then there was a network of other liberal, mostly Protestant, um, but also some conservative Jewish and reformed Jewish um, clergy around the country um, who were involved. And um, and I think it's important, to, first of all, that, to underline that they were there and that their congregations supported them uh, very actively and financially and in other ways. I mean, the clergy consultation service, it also, they opened the first 
abortion clinic in the United States. The first freestanding abortion clinic was opened by Judson Church, right? The, the New York chapter of the clergy consultation service after New York changed its law, right? So that's putting, that, that's, that's um, dissolving the line between faith and works, right? That's, that's really wor on the works side. Um, and they also, um, they risked jail. And in fact, there were um, a couple of clergy members who were still um, facing potential uh, jail time at the time of Roe versus Wade. Um, and they worked with doctors who also were willing to go to jail, including uh, Morgan Toller in Canada, who did go to jail for 18 months. Um, so I think when we, um, I, mean, I, I consider myself a person of faith. Um, I usually go to synagogue once a week. Um, I'm part of the social action committee at my synagogue. Um, we read books <laughs> about social action. That's usually what we do. Um, uh, I think it's a good challenge to think about people who consider themselves people of faith who were willing to do a lot more than that. Um, and even for people who are agnostic and, and atheist, um, I think it's worth it to think about the risks that those folks were willing to take. Um, and uh, in terms of the Catholic Church, I think it's interesting. I think I don't think there was there was anything like full throated support, even for the for the sterilization initiatives. Um, in theory, right, Catholic doctrine is just as much opposed to sterilization as it is to abortion. Um, but uh, but usually at the level of practice, you know, the church is, doesn't lift a finger to fight um, coercive um, uh, or involuntary sterilization. Um, there was just this one moment um, that I think I mentioned to you, um, where when the with the proposal to um, improve the sterilization guidelines uh, was before the New York City Council, and there was one council member who said, "I have to be in favor of this because I'm getting pressure from both the church and from the National Organization for Women. <laughs> so how could I not favor this proposal?" Um, but that was that was an anomaly, so far as I know. Um, it may have been that the church didn't oppose it in the way that they opposed, you know, the decriminalization of abortion. I think that's certainly true. Yeah. Thanks. Um, another issue that came up for me as a historian was this is a New York state, it's New York City, New York state case study. And you make the case, I think explicitly and, and certainly implicitly that this is really important. This is like, there's a reason we're, I'm talking about New York. Um, but there were other liberal locales, there were other reform movements, I'm particularly thinking about California, you mentioned Illinois, Hawaii, other states, um, I think Colorado, perhaps. So what's the case, well, you know, don't tell me the case for New York, but put it in the perspective of nationally. Um, what do we learn or what do we need to know about what else is happening in terms of reform, repeal, uh, decriminalization, um, uh, uh, anti-sterilization movements? Um, that, uh, that, that, yeah, it's enough that it was your mother <laughs> that you studied New York. <laughs> it's enough, you know, Diane, it's enough that, um, you know, that there's this sterilization and abortion decriminalization going on at the same time, but yet, can you mm -hmm. zoom out a little bit? Yeah. Um, so there was a national reform movement and then there was a national repeal movement that came very quickly on its heels. And um, they're both significant. Those are both national movements. Um, uh, you know, the reason that uh, that Roe and Doe um, repeal statutes in 42 states and not 50 states is because there had already been, you know, a significant movement, right, in eight states. Um, and those are the states that had something close to repeal um, before Roe and Doe. Uh, or is it 46? I Maybe mean, it's 46 states, right? Um, that it, so it's only, only four states that had something like repeal, um, but, but uh, a larger number had had uh, significant reforms prior to Roe. And that was because there were state level movements. And I, so I think one of the things that, um, one of the things that I learned in the project is the degree to which statutory law is critically important, right? State statutory law is critically important and state and local level campaigns for statutory law reform are critically important. And you know, and 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 those are the critical, in this case, those are the critical campaigns on the way toward federal constitutional rights, right? Um, I think I, I focus on New York, not just because it's, you know, where I happened 
to wind up with my own family story, but also because New York really was a leader. Um, and that's not just an artifact of my sources, right? It was first a leader on the on the reform side. It was Percy Sutton from Harlem, who was part of the reform democratic movement with my parents, um, who introduced the first reform bill. Um, and then and then quickly New York lost the momentum for a while. Um, California passed a reform in 67, and there were a bunch of others. Um, uh, but then when repeal was on the table, my mother's bill, when that was when that was under consideration, New York was way ahead of the rest of the country, and it became the test case, uh, the statutory um, the statutory test around which everyone rallied. Um, and repeal bills were introduced elsewhere thereafter. But then the fate of that New York bill was critically important. It was the it was the thing around which now at the national level and NARAL as it started to emerge. Um, uh, centered their efforts initially. And then of course, once New York changes its law, um, that's transformative in a way that no other state legal changes because of the lack of residence requirement. Yeah. You talked about um, what else is important. And so I wanna open up from that and the larger conversation that's been touched on occasionally today about putting Roe in perspective and the big historical picture um, beyond just um, which you alluded to in your slides as well. So there's a lot in this book about what else was happening, what else needs to happen. You have a wonderful ending where you kind of say, okay, here's the lessons, <laughs> here are the historical lessons for us today. Could you talk a little bit about what do we learn from this history in New York uh, about what else is important besides the Supreme Court in uh, reproductive, politics generally? Yeah, I think um, it's kind of an interesting um, like parallel or other side of the coin to what Jen Holland was saying, I think, um, and what others have been saying about the, the anti-reproductive um, rights movement. You know, there's something about their, their tirelessness and the fact that they just keep coming and coming and coming. Um, what I see for, at least for this relatively short period of time, is that the is that this movement the, or these two movements are tireless in that way, and and they're willing to go to to work in any institutional venue, right? In whichever whichever legal institution seems to offer them an opportunity is the legal institution in which they work. So it could be statutory, it could be regulatory, it could be municipal, it could be state level, it could be federal level, um, it could be at the hospital level. You know that they were willing to go where the fight was or to make the fight um, in any of those institutions. And I think that, I mean, maybe that's obvious today to people who are doing activist work on the ground on reproductive rights and justice, but it, it really came home to me that that this is, a, this is a movement that, you know, in 1967 in New York, there was a state constitutional convention and the people who were in favor of abortion decriminalization, as well as liberalizing the divorce laws, they thought they needed to have a state constitutional amendment in order to achieve their goals, right? And then within three years, they win this dramatically liberalizing statute at the state level. Um, but they, and they, they win in that short, short period of time against what seemed to them like almost insurmountable odds um, because they kind of leave it all in the field. You know, they give everything to the movement. They fight everywhere. Um, they work indefatigably. They work in, um, for better or worse, um, they work in whatever coalition will move the, you know, will move the ball down the field. Um, you know, they work their their kind of problematic coalitions as well as their less problematic coalitions, um, and and they achieve enormous success. You know, enormous legal change. And so I think. You know, obviously we don't, um, the, the, the pro-reproductive rights and justice side of things doesn't have the kind of resources that the anti, that the oppos opposition groups have. Um, uh, but I think we do learn something about, um, about giving that kind of dedication to the movement and that it, it was possible, it is possible to win very sizable victories very quickly. Yeah, yeah, I think the locus is also really important. What you said about, I was very struck by just community organizing around hospital procedures about hospital policies is one level of politics, as well as those people going to Sacramento, as well as those people going to the courts, et cetera. 
Um, so there's a lot about the uh, uh, decriminalization of abortion, but also in the movement to um, uh, resist involuntary sterilization, to sort of end involuntary sterilization. Uh, there's another social movement story here that was very familiar to me. And um, we were talking a little bit about lunch about the, the right wing. And I was so happy to hear about all the splinters in the anti-work movement. It's like, it not only left sectarianism, there's right sectarianism, but there is definitely feminist sectarianism here. And it's so familiar. I wonder if you could talk a little bit, you talk about differences and roadblocks and things we need to learn from, but um, yeah. I framed what I saw in, in your book as a real tension between single issue, we need to change this law, for example, a reproductive rights narrow view and intersecting agendas of social justice. Um, but particularly on sterilization, you alluded to in your talk, this conflict between mainstream liberal feminists and radical feminists, women of color, um, communities of color, um, you know, it's between the population control tendency in the uh, reproductive rights movement and then the uh, individual uh, choice uh, to bear children and have the opportunity to bear children. So I don't know, what can you tell us from this story about um, not just that tension, but the other tensions that you said you learned so much about, for example, when you did that Zoom collective interview with the women from Karasa, you know, remembering back on what things were like. Uh, can you talk more about that? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, one thing I learned from that in particular, I, so I had a group meeting with a lot of people who had been part of CESA and Karasa. And one of the one of the interesting things about this um, is that, you know, a lot of them are our colleagues. Um, so there's a story which I don't really capture in the book, but um, but that somebody should write, maybe me, um, about the impact of this story on uh, academic feminism also. So Atina Grossman, the historian of Germany, was a part of Carassa. Joan Kelly, the leading women's historian, um, was closely allied with Carassa. Um, the anthropologists Faye Ginsburg and Rainer Rapp um, were very involved. Um, Meredith Tax, who's a historian, who was the late Meredith Tax, who was a historian outside the academy, was very involved, um, uh, and a lot of others. Um, so anyway, one thing I learned is that um, they weren't very nice to me. <laughs> there, was, there was still a kind of sectarian spirit. Um, and uh, these are not people um, of whom you, you want to run afoul. <laughs> It was early in the Zoom period, and I didn't record the Zoom in exactly the right. There's a little like um, out of syncness <laughs> between the vi the video and the and the audio, and that was that was very bad. Anyway, um, but they also people still have really deep memories um, and and painful memories of this time. And so Karen Stam, for example, who is sort of a hero of the book, she also she still sort of believes that the lesbian feminists who drove Karasa apart, um, uh, and these they were the people who were most responsible for this were Sarah Shulman and Maxine Wolf, who were later pivotally important in the Women's Committee of ACT UP. And Sarah's the, you know, the chronicler of the history of New York ACT UP. So, and they're very left-wing lesbian feminists, Maxine and Sarah. And Karen Stam still sort of believes that they were police spies who had been planted at Karasa intentionally to break it up. Um, you know, there are these very deep, bitter memories. Um, and Sarah and Maxine um, still think that, uh, that their experience in Karasa was like the worst experience of their entire lives, even though they've had such, you know, they've made such a huge difference. They've been so um, celebrated for their role in, uh, in activist movements. Like there's this deep, um, there are these deep, deep, bitter memories, and uh, it, and it's very, it's very instructive and very important. And I learned a lot about, particularly about um, how lesbian feminism has been, um, has been as you know, as a distinct uh, political practice and ideology, has really not been represented in our historiography, um, and really needs to be. I meant that. Um, and glad to know there is some work going on now to do that. And I think we should open it up to your questions and comments and um, start here. Yeah. 
you to talk about the ACLU. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so That's I, good. Yes, I want Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, my question is about the ACLU, because why were they confused? Yeah, well, others may have been in these papers, but I think I think the um, the Women's Rights Project people, right, and this is RBG, right, um, although she's she's uh, teaching at Rutgers and then at NYU um, during this period. Um, I, she actually shows up in my mom's papers, um, RBG. Um, so she, she's a little bit she's a she's a little bit um, outside of it by this point. But their initial reaction is uh, is kind of horror at the sterilization guidelines. They react exactly the way the Planned Parenthood people react, although for different reasons. Because you know they've just been doing these cases for people who are seeking sterilization, and they've been fighting hospitals. It's not a statutory problem, but it's a hospital level problem that hospitals will not perform sterilization procedures on white women, white married women unless they meet this American College, uh, College of Gynecologists standard, which is uh, right, you have to be, um, the, the, right, your age times four has to be over 120, yeah. or else you cannot get sterilized. <laughs> so- The number of children you've already had is a factor in that also. Oh, right, right, right. The number, right, the number of children times your age yeah, that, that's that's right. That's what it is. It's not it's not times four. I just always think about a thirty year old has to have four children in order to be eligible for sterilization. Right, right. So it's the number of children times your age has to be over one hundred and twenty, or else you can't get sterilized. So the ACLU actually did litigate on behalf of sterilization seekers, and they initially saw it as a matter of reproductive rights, and that people's reproductive rights or their liberty would be interfered with if there were rigorous um, sterilization guidelines. Right. And then there's a very there's an intense internal conversation and it's feminists talking to feminists. Um, and there's some pretty yucky stuff that that's in the Women's Rights Project papers of um, white white women, not RBG, but others who were involved in the project saying like, but but some people should be sterilized, shouldn't they? You know, or you know, some people or some people would like to be sterilized, but their men won't let them because they 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 have machismo in their cultures, or you know, stuff like that. So um, it's uh, on the from the outside, what happens is they change their position and then they they support the sterilization guidelines. But internally, if you read the not very well organized uh, records. Um, there's some very complicated stuff going on. I'm trying to remember, does Leanne Wheeler talk about this in her book on sex and civil liberties? She doesn't go up this far. Go up this far, okay, yeah. But, but the ACLU has complications about sex and civil liberties for a long time, is what I want to say. Yeah. yeah thanks for this, this is amazing. Um, I'm really interested in the genocidal language because that's not um, entirely a gendered language, or at least like it's not, um, just pertaining to women. And I would think that um, in terms of the community sort of thinking about genocide or attempted Jew genocide, like the Jewish community in New York would be pretty pivotal. And then also in terms of the folks um, that are coming from diasporas. Um, I'm wondering, like, can you say more about the, um, like the details of the communities of color um, within New York. So there were Puerto Ricans, right? But what about say Dominicans, Haitians, um, other folks? And what about the men of color? Where are they with us? Good question. Um, so I, I, I don't know about, um, I don't know about communities of color like as a social history or a public opinion thing. I but I know I know about the Black Panther Party for self-defense, right, which was calling attention to sterilization abuse. Um, but also um, and both of both abortion um, and sterilization abuse as genocidal. What happens in New York is that the leaders of the Black Panther Party are in jail. Um, um, that you know, includes Afeni Shakur, Tupac Shakur's mother. Um, their whole leadership is uh, arrested on trumped up charges and they're, so they're imprisoned. And that is part of the reason that the Young Lords Party becomes the leading kind of militant people of color group that's that's pursuing this healthcare politics. Um, 
in, in both in East Harlem and in the South Bronx. Um, and what happens in the Young Lords Party is really interesting because they start out with the discourse about genocide, which refers, refers both to abortion as genocide and to sterilization abuse as genocide. And then um, there's a women, there's a feminist politics inside the Young Lords Party. There's a women's committee that that forms and challenges that perspective. And with, where they ultimately go is they favor um, abortions under community control. Um, and uh, and and then they still oppose sterilization abuse as as both imperialism and racism, as, as a form of imperialism and racism. Um, and and an abrogation of women's rights, but it's really it's really interesting. And have the same I don't know if it's the same thing. A similar thing happens inside the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. There's actually a women's commission that forms that chat that um, makes an internal bid for um, for some control over the agenda. Um, and um, so I think that's important. I um, there isn't the same there isn't the same degree of kind of militant political activity happening among um, Dominicans or Haitians um, in New York. Like um, if, I if I was looking in Democratic Party places, I would find, you know, I would find those communities, but, um, you know, but in the militant left politics that are, that are problematizing sterilization abuse, I don't really. Um, and the South Bronx at this time was still, it was, it was basically, um, American born black people and Puerto Ricans, some of them were American born black people um, and white ethnics, but it wasn't the kind of, um, oops, it wasn't the kind of melange um, of immigrant groups that it is today. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was curious how much um, post Roe some of the divides on the left were prompted by Roe, or or I guess by the perceived conservative response to Roe, right? So the, if you conceded that there could be a problem when it came to sterilization, would that mean conceding there was a problem with abortion or somehow, you know, acknowledging there's a chink in the armor of Roe? And if I, I guess I'm curious too, if the the reasons for the rift in the coalition changed before and after Roe, mm -hmm. um, because there was, I think in more recent decades, there was always a kind of fear of acknowledging there being anything wrong with the delivery of certain forms of reproductive health care being an opening to the idea that abortion providers were coercive or were butchers or were, um, you know, the, often the abortion industry was driven by, et cetera, et cetera. So um, crediting those stories. So I don't know if, if that was something you saw, but I, I wanted to hear more about that. Yeah, I think the way it worked, um, well, CESA didn't form before Roe. Um, uh, and I think there was a little bit of an anti-sterilization politics prior to that in anti-imperialist circles and socialist feminist circles, um, but not much. Um, I think I think the way it formed was more. Um, it was a critique of. I mean, I was thinking about your work a lot. Think a kind of a critique of post Roe politics and the way Roe, you know, gets deployed and the way um, Roe as reproductive rights becomes um, so central to the definition of American feminism, and. So talking about sterilization abuse and starting from sterilization abuse, talking about a wider reproductive rights agenda is a way to talk about how we need a feminism that's more that's more encompassing, right? So it it was so Roe was sort of a it was a starting point for critique, but not a critique of um, of coercive abortion, right? Or abortion as itself problematic, so much as the the way that. Um, that Roe and abortion rights, you know, were deployed in feminist politics, and and insisting that that wasn't enough, you know, and that and that the sort of the the immediate thing is there's the scandal around the Ralph sisters, which is just six months after Roe, and um, and that be, that's really the uh, the uh, the spur for for the formation of CESA. Um, and Helen Rodriguez Trias goes to like one of the early meetings of the women's health movement, and nobody wants to talk about the Ralph sisters, you know. And there's actually a lot of pushback from white women at this conference 
um, you know, who who don't want to talk about the dangers of sterilization abuse, and that becomes so that's kind of the start. Um, but I don't think I don't think Helen is alone. I think there are right. I think there are a lot of people who 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 sort of feel like okay, that well, that battle's won, so we don't have to worry about that anymore, and now we can talk about you know the rest of the agenda and why that that is not a sufficient kind of stand in for right for the promise of American feminism. Where is the, oh, there was a question over oh, there. Thank you. Now I'm really, really looking forward to reading this. Um, I have a question about process. You know, you talked about some of the, so the bitter inner feminist fights and the emotionalness of this, and, you know, clearly sometimes racism and homophobia and ableism entered into all of this. How did you decide when to put that in the book and when not to? Um, that's really interesting. Um, I felt, I felt a little, I felt funny about the fact, for example, that Karen Stam, who I, who I interviewed twice, uh, maybe three times, and whose personal papers I used before she deposited in the archives at Smith, um, uh, and who was like very important and helpful to the book, and then in the Carasa story, she says these things that seem so crazy to me um, and homophobic. And, and I, I really paused like as a, as a narrative matter, you know, I'm, I'm kind of establishing this person as a hero of the text and then here she is. Um, but I had to go with it because it's true. You know, it's just actually, no, you know, I, I'll, 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 I'll be even more honest than that. Sarah Shulman called me on it. <laughs> to be honest. Um, uh, I was, I, I interviewed Sarah Shulman and uh, uh, I, I said, you know, Karen Stam still thinks that you were a police spy. <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, and, uh, and, and she was very insistent that that had to go in the book, that that's part of this, that's a really important part of the story. Um, so, uh, I don't know if that's a full answer to your question, but I did run into difficult stuff around that. And when I was, especially when I was narrating this, this fight that happens in Carasa, um, I just was aware that I had to tell the perspectives that just, you know, share the perspectives of all the people that I, that I interviewed and, you know, um, and kind of tell the truth. Um, I, I guess I felt that way a little bit about telling my own mother's story, like, um, I am very critical of the kind of liberal feminism that my mother was affiliated with. And at the same time, I loved my mother and I honor her contribution. And I think it was a real contribution. Um, and I just had to hold both of those things and just allow them both to be true without, you know, without there being any kind of choice, you know. Um, and I certainly, I refuse any... Um, kind of simple or blanket story about quote unquote white feminism and it be, that white feminism being irrelevant or terrible or something like, um, you know, if, if nothing else, I think the story provides a lot of nuance, but also, you know, some home truths. Tim had a, pardon me? That's the go last one. Can we ask Tim's last right? question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I can sit no, no, go ahead, and then we'll last one. Um, I loved the book. I read it. I gave it to my mother. Uh, I loved learning that there was a pre-row state legislative history of abortion, right? Which, which is, I mean, if you have looked at sodomy law or anti-discrimination law in the area of human rights history, that's, you know, at, the, at a moment when the courts are sort of uh, not open, right? The state legislature or the city council are, and it turns out that that's also true of abortion rights, which I found just fascinating. I also um, kept thinking during the later chapters about trans stuff uh, and the way these hospital policies are so crucial. Oh, that's a great point. And I was um, wondering if you had reflections on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess my reflection is that's a great point. Um, and also just, you know, um, as a as something to remember, I guess, for us as activists and scholars, um, 
scholars of American law and its histories, like those are places where legal decisions are made, legally important, legally significant decisions are made and decisions that are important and consequential in people's lives. And so therefore those are, those are less low side of power and they're low side of contest. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I learned a lot about that from following this story and its many threads. Sometimes the fight is in the hospital therapeutic abortion committee. And sometimes it's, you know, you're protesting because there's an abortion doctor who's, you know, who's being tried um, for, uh, you know, under the criminal abortion statutes. And sometimes you're in the state legislature and sometimes you're marching down Fifth Avenue. Right, and those are all places where uh, socio-legal change is being made. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, we're just a few minutes break. <laughs>